lesson learned. Sneaking works before the warden spawns, but then after he spawns, you better just run or he's gonna find you. Ah, uh, the good old walk of shame. So, welcome back everybody to another episode of the Let's Play series. I thought we would start off today with a quick little follow-up on the Froglight farm we started last episode. It's all done now and it's actually working really well. Um, even though it's not like a super efficient design or anything, like I'm still gonna get way more than I'm ever gonna use, I think. Um, ended up doing it a little different than we had planned last time. We were gonna fill this whole thing up with the, the powdered snow before, right? And I got thinking and realizing it's like, that's gonna take at least 200 powdered snow that are gonna be very tedious to collect in place and all that kind of thing. So I ended up going with a different idea here. I, I experimented with uh, iron golems. And I just got eight powdered snow around the iron golem, some iron bars to protect them because the large magma cubes will kill them if they can touch them. And uh, with this configuration, it seems like they're not able to touch him and he's able to hit them. So he helps to break them down a little bit quicker and the powdered snow helps to get them too. And all the frogs in the magma cubes kind of just gravitate towards the center. Um, and it seems to work pretty good, right? And then uh, what we ended up doing here, nothing will spawn while we're down here though. We got the, that's what the viewing platforms for up there. Oh, and it just it just went there. So we got a two carts minecart system here, where when one minecart arrives, it tells the other one to take off. So one minecart is always collecting the stuff, and one is always dropping it off um, into the chest down here, which I did not set up item filters for or anything. How are we doing? Yeah, we got tons of stuff here. <laughs> I, I don't know how I'm ever going to use this many frog lights, but uh, we got them if we want them. Plus, we're getting magma cream from this, which is really cool. Uh, because uh, we can make magma blocks out of those. All right, so to get us started here today, I thought we would go and uh, spend a few minutes working on the Terraria underground jungle area. And this is something I've definitely been putting off. <laughs> not by accident or, or anything. It's by choice because I do not do well with large scale building in this game. And let me tell you, this, this area down here, it scares me. This thing is huge. Somehow we need to turn this into a Terraria underground jungle feeling area. So in the underground jungle of Terraria, there is a boss called the Bee Queen. And much like in Minecraft, there is honey. Lots and lots of honey around her lair. I thought it would be cool to um, try and mimic that by replacing the clay blocks here with honeycomb and the water with honey blocks. But in order to make that happen, we're gonna need a honey farm and a pretty big honey farm at that for the amount of blocks we need. So the question is, do we have a honey farm? Well, <laughs> uh, yes and no. Like a lot of things, we have one, but it's a work in progress. It's not finished. Um, it's actually been kind of a secret here. Uh -huh -huh. I don't think I've ever shown this version of it. A long, long time ago, we made a honey farm here. And I realized like every single beehive was gonna need like 14 stacks of glass bottles to fill up. And it was a huge flaw, right? And we never saw the thing again. <laughs> uh, I did eventually end up uh, fixing that problem by converting it to a minecart system. Uh, and then more recently, like a, a few months ago, I saw a video by ENX04, uh, a very cool concept, a new way of doing a honey farm. And I decided to use his idea here and I just added my own redstone to it to make it work. But here's his idea. Basically, you have a dispenser with uh, empty bottles in. It shoots it towards the beehive with uh, a redstone pulse. If there's honey in there, it picks up the honey. If there isn't, it doesn't pick it up. It goes down in the hopper to a dropper and then this shoots it back up to the next dispenser. And it's like a chain that continues down the way here. Yeah, so the really cool thing about this design is you don't need to have a giant reservoir of uh, glass bottles in the system. You just need one for each dispenser. And then you have a whatever size reservoir you want at the very end here. Each time the clock goes, it sends one bottle through the system. Uh, you might have noticed it didn't pick up the honey that, that last time. This time it did. Um, that's because like if it already picked up honey somewhere before in the chain, the bottle will be full and it can't pick up anymore, right? So um, you'll notice towards this end, more of the hives have honey in because by the time the bottle gets here, it's full. To counteract that, you just have to speed up the clock and then it'll send more bottles through the system. But as I have it running right now, pretty much every time the bottle gets to the end here, it picks up honey. 
And another reason I really like Ian's design here is because it only requires one hopper per beehive. While most bee farms, if you look, they usually require at least two, sometimes a minecart system as well to go with it. Um, and all that kind of generates a little bit of lag, right? Not really a big deal. Like it's always checking if you can pull an item down or if you can put an item inside the dropper here. Um, that's not really a big deal on a small scale, but once you try to like go large scale with a farm, which I was kind of hoping to do with this one, like I said, it's not done yet. <laughs> we want to go a lot bigger than this. Um, that little bit of lag starts to add up, right? So with the way I designed the redstone here, I had the lag in mind, especially. So you'll notice I used observers, uh, mostly because observers are very lag friendly, while redstone dust is not. It is one of the most laggy things in the game. Uh, the other thing is I do here is I lock the hopper, like pretty much all the time, except for when it needs to pick up the glass bottle. Then the piston pushes the redstone block down here and unlocks the hopper just for that brief moment to pick up the bottle. So most of the time the hoppers are not running with this farm the way I, I did the redstone, uh, which is really cool. And also I made sure not to use any redstone torches because of those cause lighting updates, which are also extremely laggy. So this should be a good design for large scale, I think, um, which is uh, what I'm gonna work on right now. <laughs> so we gotta kinda AFK here and get honey, but while I'm doing that, I'm gonna like work on uh, making this bigger. Uh, I gotta like continue breeding the bees and stuff and start building more rows and yeah, I'll, I'll spend a bit of time doing that today. Oh yeah, and check this out. I really like how this farm looks from underneath when it's running. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Uh, when it's all said and done though, we don't want all the pistons firing together like that. We'll want to stagger them so that uh, you don't get a giant lag spike when everything happens all at once like that. You want as few things happening as possible and just spread out the amount of time it happens when you're building farms. Um, but yeah, we ended up adding two more rows here and bred up a bunch of bees. Uh, that's the part that takes the longest with this, is breeding the bees. And to be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure how to go about ensuring every hive has three bees in. I was thinking about like breeding bring up uh, a ton of them, right? Then you put down trap doors so that they can go into the hives, but they can't come out. And then uh, any bees that can't find a home are probably the extras, right? And then you get rid of those, and you got three in every hive then, and then you just let them go. Um, the other thing I'm not entirely sure about, with beehives, they, they have a tag that keeps track of where the last flower is that they harvested. And sometimes the bees nudge each other far away from their hive. And I'm not sure if they self-correct that after a while, or if you somehow need to program, like this bee, he's struggling a little bit to get back home. If you have to like program and tell them to get the flower right in front of their hive only. <laughs> uh, I'm not a bee expert. Anyways, we got 240 hives here now, and when this is all, when they're all bred up, we'll have 720 bees in the farm, so... I'm gonna maybe just see how laggy that is before we go beyond that. Um, obviously not all the bees are out at the same time, most of them are in the hive. But uh, yeah, check this out, we got some honey saved up, so let's head back to the underground jungle. <laughs> well, that honey we had sure didn't last too long here, we pretty much used it all up, but we got a small sample area done. And check it out, what do you guys think? I think... Uh, it turned out pretty cool actually. I, I'm liking it a lot, especially like when you add these drippy down areas. I've been using the yellow frog lights uh, underneath the honey down there so it's lit up in certain areas. And uh, yeah, I think it's gonna be really cool when it's all done. I, I, I wanna go back there with it. Um, maybe up to the top as well, get rid of a bunch of those vines up there and try to do a shape like uh, maybe like this will fill up with honey. And then like put the bee queen up there and have her staring down at us and a bunch of our drones flying around. Now I hate to say it though, we probably shouldn't do more on this today because it does take forever to collect the honey. Even with uh, our big farm, the way it is right now, it probably takes an hour to get a shulker box full. And we probably need at least five shulker boxes. So yeah, that's not going to happen. So let's move on here. We're going to do something else i wanted to put like a plantera boss fight in this area here remember we built the plantera ball previously those of you that have played terraria you know what a terraria boss arena looks like they all kind of look the same <laughs> you have a bunch of wooden platforms 
at various height levels. And we're going to do something similar here using wooden slabs, I think. And then you also have your healing uh, agents on the platform in a bunch of areas as well. Like you got your campfires, you got your heart lamps. You gonna get me? He's gonna get me. <laughs> this place is so dangerous. What am I doing here? Uh huh. Yeah. So it's not your uh, typical Minecraft build. It's a little bit on the goofy side, but I, I think it works, right? We got our respawn room over there. You got the honey to to get your regen going. We got our heart containers in the on chains like you do in the game. Crafting table with the blue lantern on top. Anyways, we got ourselves a battle arena here. Now I'm trying to decide: do we put Plantera behind the arena or in front of it? Hmm. I think my instinct is telling me let's put it in front of the arena this side here because uh, like we got to decide what's the main feature here is it the battle arena or is it Plantera I think Plantera is what we want to stand out and it should be in the front uh -oh. Uh -oh. plus I think that's how it works in Terraria right uh, the boss is always in front of the stuff you build I could be wrong I haven't played it in a while <laughs> this is like uh, such a nightmare working here by the way I don't want to do much more I really should have lit it up. Um, okay, what we gotta do is try to find the perfect place to build Plantera. I think we're gonna go maybe... Let's start here? Oh dear. Uh, this is a little tricky actually, I'm not quite sure how to start this. I think, uh, like I'm looking at a picture of Plantera right now. I think um, we want to try to get the teeth right first. So we'll do the inside of the mouth, try to get that shape properly, and then we'll worry about the rest of Plantera. Um, so we're going to use dripstone for teeth. And let's say this is the very tip of the mouth. I think I want to go three blocks to the next tip. Yeah, we'll have a little opening like that. And then we'll just mirror the top and the bottom portion. Whoa, no! Plan that. Yeah. Okay, we're all good. <laughs> oh dear, I got so many holes to fill once I'm done this too. Um, I was just thinking, let's make this three wide. I know, like, Plantera is a 2D image, but we gotta try to add some depth to it. So let's, let's not put the teeth in the middle. Let's put, like, maybe, let's, let's have two sides of teeth, two rows. How amazing would it be if we got this perfect the first time? <laughs> oh, that would be incredible, wouldn't it? Uh, I don't know about that, though. So we gotta match it up with this. Let's get this over here. I think this is the same, top and bottom. Uh, I think that's a decent shape for it, but I think uh, I think we do need to move it. I think it's got to go like five blocks this way. Okay, so we got Plantera mostly done there. We we're going to check it out in just a second, but we are still building a little bit. Uh, this is the hard part now, it turns out. We got to somehow, like, organically connect vines to Plantera <laughs> while dealing with the mobs and, uh, you know fall damage and all that kind of stuff okay we got our vine connected now after i get it connected i just go back down my path here and shave off some of the rough edges to try uh make it look a little smoother and here we go again back down at the mobs whoa no darn it <laughs> oh man Truthfully, this was one of the most difficult and frustrating things I have built in a long time. <laughs> but even still, I think it turned out pretty good. I'm really happy with the results of it, just not the, the process of going through it. I should have lit up the area before I started, but uh, yeah, check it out. We got ourselves a Plantera with a battle arena. And uh, I think I made a couple mistakes with this. Uh... I had a hard time getting the vines connecting in a good spot. I think that's not quite the, the central point I wanted. I think I wanted it more over there. But yeah, it's fine, right? <laughs> we got magenta clay for the tongue. We got the pink terracotta, the glazed pink terracotta for the flower part of it. And the dripstone for the teeth. Uh, the other mistake maybe is the angle. Like it looks really cool from here, right? <laughs> But we don't really get that view from down below or even from this angle. It's cool. Underneath some carpet, we got a little bit of lighting so it stays nice and bright. And yeah, overall, I think we're good here. I haven't seen it from here, actually. 
Ooh, that's freaky. Imagine. Man, you can actually imagine what it's like playing Terraria now. If you were the character, have one of those things coming for you, that would be freaky. <laughs> oh, snap. Uh, let's see it from this side of the, the battle arena. Did I make the right choice putting it in front? I think so. I think the battle arena obstructs too much of the view of it. Anyways, I think I'm happy with our progress here in the underground area. We're going to move on in just a second. First, I wanted to show you the Amethyst farm, right? Uh, remember, we set up that Terraria jungle tune for it. I told myself a million times, don't update the redstone when you hook it up to the, the Amethyst farm. And uh, I accidentally updated it. <laughs> so the harvest happened already. We've got two stacks and 18 shards. Unfortunately, I can't show you guys that now. You'll just have to imagine it. And then two stacks and 18 shards flew up here. It was amazing. It was so incredible. You had to have seen it though. You had to be, you had to have been here. Anyways, okay, one more fun thing to talk about. Uh, so what else does the underground jungle have? Hmm, what am I looking for here? Is it in here? I don't think it's in here. Not in there. Is it in our aqua kit maybe? Ah, oh, we only got one? <laughs> I need more than one. I wonder if we got more somewhere else. Yeah, we got to get some flying turtles, guys. That's like one of the key features of the underground jungle, right? How are we going to make turtles fly in here? I want your feedback. Do we just drop them from the ceiling? Do we give them slow falling potions? Do we launch them with slime block launchers? I don't know, but somehow we need to make turtles fly here. And I'm open for ideas. Okay, so I just had a little bit of an idea here. We are going to go and... Uh, Try set up a shortcut to getting to Deep Slate from the Man Cave. Right now, we still don't really have a great way of doing that. There's like a long, windy path I can take, but it's like very time consuming. <laughs> so let's make it a bit easier. We want to get to minus 415 right over here. Okay. And we're going to maybe set up an elevator here eventually, but let's just uh, let's see what happens if we go down around here. If I measured right, this is the spot, I think. Okay, somewhere around here. We're gonna dig straight down because we got fire resistance. I'm not scared of anything. Whoa! <laughs> We're gonna go through a few layers here, but it's fine. And there we go, perfect. All right, let's try this out now. So from the man cave, I wanna go check out the Terraria underground jungle. Oh, how am I gonna get there from here? We're gonna run through here to minus 415 which is right over here then we're gonna fall down whoa, all the way to here and then we go through our dolphin booster and there we go right from the man cave nice and quick whoa man you really slide <laughs> i shifted there and i kept going that was weird oh you know what it is i don't think i've ever tried walking sideways before and i, I did it by accident there look at this this is this is really weird we just have a little bit of time left this episode, so I thought we would do some stuff over at Sandy City. Um, you know, I think the key to making any build look good is details, and guess where there's no details? Outside of Sandy City. <laughs> we just got the plain old desert here, pretty much, and nothing else. There's no colors, no nothing really. So what we want to do is start changing that, right? So thankfully we got azalea bushes now. These are great for adding green. Yeah, let's do a little test here too. I'm gonna put coarse dirt on the left side and we'll leave it as sand on the right side and we'll see which side we prefer. It's a bit of a hard call actually. I think I do prefer the coarse dirt side to the sand side, but it also looks unnatural to me. I don't think that quite works. Maybe there's a different block. Maybe we gotta go path blocks instead. Can we uh, path block these? Yes, you can, look at that. Yeah, I think that's the way to go. The path box are closer in color to the sand than the dirt is, so it doesn't look quite as out of place. Still not quite the perfect match, though. <laughs> but uh, I think that's the way we're going to do it. Yeah, and anywhere we come across birch leaves, we are going to get rid of those because azalea bushes just look a lot better, don't they? <laughs> All right. Um, also, I was kind of curious what we should do here. I've never really liked going from grass to sand. What's a good in-between transition? Just, just path blocks or do we mix in some dirt? I'm not sure. I'm going to experiment with that a little bit. You know, it's actually 
Oh, wait a second. I just had an idea. Actually, never mind. <laughs> it's too yellow. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder what else we could do. Like, I don't hate it, but I don't love it, right? It's not, uh, it's not quite doing it for me. How do you guys deal with this problem? Do you even deal with it? I don't know. Maybe we need more transition. Maybe we add coarse dirt along with the path blocks. Yeah, I just did a little sample here with coarse dirt. I definitely don't like the coarse dirt. Cool, cool. All right, so we got uh, path blocks and azalea bushes all around the perimeter now. And it's very much like a, a low effort thing doing this. <laughs> but those little details, I tell you, you start doing a few things like this around the place and uh, they start to come together and it starts to feel a lot better. Um, so we got some, some plants along here now. We definitely need some kind of path going through here. But it's really weird because it's like a, a strong slant towards the, the pyramid. There were a lot of mistakes with this build. Um, this pyramid should be inside the wall, not outside of it, too, by the way. <laughs> but it's a little too late to change that, right? I didn't really know what I was doing when I built this. Anyways, time to wrap things up here and uh, get to the comment of the day. It says, hey, Etho, I have a question that's been bugging me for a while now. I've noticed that your voice often changes very quickly in tone, confidence, and level, even between words. And I remember in your older videos, you used to be much more monotone. I'm pretty sure you mentioned ages ago that you purposefully made an effort to have more energy in your videos and keep things less monotone. I don't know if I've ever said that. I'm wondering if you still think about that while creating content or if it's, if it's simply become your natural voice. Uh, it's, it's a pretty natural thing for me now. Although I find if I put a little extra effort in, I can get way more range in my voice <laughs> if I think about it. Or would your voice still be monotonous if you didn't think about it? Just curious. I love your voice, but it's been plaguing my brain. So I don't think I would have a flat voice. Like if I didn't think about it, I think I'd have quite a bit of range still. But uh, yeah, you're definitely correct. In my older videos, I had a very, very monotone voice and just slowly... Over time, I naturally became more and more enthusiastic in my videos. And it was kind of a combination of several factors. A perfect storm of monotone etho. <laughs> that kind of led to that. Uh, first one probably being I was the very first ASMR YouTuber on, on the platform, I think. And I had my mic settings completely wrong. So if I made any bit of noise, the microphone would peak, right? So I got into the habit of speaking very quietly, very softly into the microphone, never making any drastic changes in my voice, right? And you get into the habit of doing that, and uh, yeah, you, you become monotone. The other thing is, like, when I first started YouTube, I didn't want anyone to know what I was doing, and I was living with family at the time, right? And, uh, you know... So I'm like very trying to be very quiet in my room so that nobody would be like, Etho, why are you talking to yourself in your room? What are you doing in there? Right. And I didn't want anyone getting curious in case um, my original plan was if uh, I ever wanted out of this YouTube gig, I would just delete all my videos and nobody would ever know what I was doing in my room. Right. They wouldn't have to watch the cringy monotone Etho talking in the videos and discover my my horrible Let's play. <laughs> uh, but, you know, too many people watched my videos and that never happened. I eventually had to tell everybody what I was doing. So, yeah, moved on from that. Uh, the other thing is, though, talking by yourself, you just naturally aren't very expressive compared to talking to another person. So I think it was when I first joined Minecraft that uh, that started to change. Uh, if you ever watch back my videos, that's when I sort of start getting more expressive. Uh, season three of Minecraft. Uh, you just naturally, when you're talking to people, you light up, you light up a lot more, right? Um, and then finally, I think it's just a natural skill that develops too. So public speaking is something you learn to do better the more you do it. And part of that is expressing your voice, enunciating certain words stronger than others, and uh, just adding variety makes your speech more interesting and you just learn to do it naturally and i think that's especially true here on youtube because guess what we do after we're done speaking and into our microphone 
we get to go and edit our video and then hear ourselves back again. So it's almost like we're studying ourselves <laughs> as we make our videos. And you hear yourself again, and it's like, oh, I was kind of quiet there, not too excited. I could have done that a little bit better. Oh, I peaked the microphone at that part. I got to be careful about about overpronouncing my P's, you know? <laughs> and you start making notes like that almost uh, instinctively or, or without really thinking about it. Uh huh. And over time, that you adjust your voice too because of that. Anyways, great question. Thank you for that. And hopefully you guys enjoyed the episode. Thank you for watching. Until the next one, take care. Have a good day. Bye-bye.